We'll let it finish. bring it back to j just my comment on this is this person the fact that she's a, a woman has nothing to do with anything except for the fact that justin trudeau accuses everyone else of being a misogynist while simultaneously persecuting a metis woman this woman is more courageous than the cowards who are persecuting her and the politicians who are grinning ear to ear while she spends 48 days in jail. Uh, and this is what class and this is what courage looks like. Now, sometimes you don't have a choice but to be courageous because you have no choice. The system arrests you, holds you for two and a half weeks on nonviolent mischief charges, brings you back a second time to try to get you back in jail, gets you back in jail on a third time, keeps you there for another, what was it, two plus weeks? That is what courage looks like in the face of cowardice political persecution. And when the judge referred to prosecutor, Crown Prosecutor Karimji as energetic, in my mind, that's a euphemism for lacking ethics. Uh, and it's a fitting intro for today's stream because maybe, you know, we've had the Alberta Court of Appeals decision come down, free the Pavlovsky brothers, strike down their contempt convictions, strike down their $20,000 in fines and $13,000 in court costs. We have Tamara Lich being released right now. And now we have Dr. Francis Christian petitioning the courts to try to get justice in the face of yet further injustice when, I'm not wearing the right shirt, when politics ruins everything, medicine, music, science, politics, it's going to be good. We've got Dr. Francis Christian on for a second time. We've got his lawyer, Andre Mamari, and I'm, I hope it's it's probably Mamori. I'm going to ask him how to pronounce his last name. And we've got Robert Barnes. So I'm going to bring in the Brady Bunch of squares in no particular order. In a second, I almost forgot. Thank you for the super chats. Um, I This is in reference to a, a, a comment I made a few minutes ago that I, I once ran over a roadrunner while driving through Death Valley with my wife, and I once ran over a rabbit. But we just drove from Austin, Texas to Albuquerque, New Mexico, because my daughter wanted to see all of the scenes, the locations for Breaking Bad, and what a day, and what a TikTok video she's going to make with it. Uh, Super Chats, YouTube takes 30%. If you don't like that, um, if you don't like that, we're on Rumble as well. 
And we're going to be taking a portion of this exclusively to Rumble after we talk about Dr. Francis Christian's lawsuit. We're going to take questions from the chats that I don't think we can ask or answer on YouTube without the doctors at YouTube telling us that what the doctor doctor is telling us is medical misinformation. So we'll get there. Skyla was not working the register. Mila, Mila, may I have the uh, the bag of... Hold on, I'll show you just one thing that we got. One thing, we're going to see what happens when we try to fly back with this. It's candy people from the candy lady that looks like Walter White's crystal man. No, 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 no. And we got some other goodies. Okay. Um, okay, let's bring in the Brady Bunch of, they're going to have the lawyers, lawyer, doctor. Hold on. We're going to do it this way. Yes, this is going to work. Gentlemen, can we just do a quick mic check so that everyone can be heard? Francis, starting with you. Oh, hi, uh, Viva, Andre, Robert. Good to see you again, Robert. And uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for that uh, opening piece on Tamara. Uh, that is uh, the best news in a long time. Uh, Tamara has truly become a Gandhian figure for the movement. Absolutely. Uh, Maitre Mamari. First of all, how do we pronounce your last name? It's Mamari, and good to be with you and everybody else. Looking mm -hmm. forward to this. All right. And Robert, how you doing? Uh, good, good. You, you following the Jones trial today? Uh, bits and pieces, bits and pieces. The insanity continues. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to check the, uh, everyone says audio's good. Audio, good. Great audio. Good. Um, so I guess we're going to start with Dr. Francis Christian. It's the second time on the channel. So some of you may have already seen that first sidebar. Um, you may already know some of the stuff that we're going to go over. But before we just get into any of it, Dr. Francis Christian, 30,000 foot overview. Who are you? Credentials. Before we get into Andre, who is he? Credentials. And then we're going to get into the discussion. Um, thank you. Um, as you said, uh, my name is Francis Christian. Uh, I'm a surgeon um, and uh, I just retired on the 1st of March this year as a professor of surgery uh, after more than 30 years of being a surgeon. Uh, I hold uh, fellowships uh, from both the College of Surgeons in Edinburgh and the College of Surgeons of Canada. Uh, and um, so in, in a lot of uh, cases in this crazy pandemic that we've been in, um, people say, oh, you have to go into your lane of specialty. Although my pediatric colleagues have often told me that, you know, I don't really know. I just do what the public health guys uh, tell me to do. So I want to uh, inform your audience that I have expertise in data analysis, evidence-based medicine, ethics, professionalism, uh, quality and patient safety. Uh, I've regularly published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, given numerous presentations at grand rounds. Uh, I've invited uh, for lectures and in several conferences. I've taught medical students and residents in data analysis, evidence-based medicine, and the scientific critique of articles in medical journals. And as director of patient safety and quality in the Department of Surgery in Saskatchewan, a, a post from which I was fired. When I was director, I introduced and implemented the what is called the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. And that's a very data intensive program. Uh, I also, together with the computer science department of the university, conceptualized and developed uh, the morbidity and mortality app for iPhone and Android. Uh, for the secure recording and transmitting of patient-related data. Uh, this app, ironically, is now being used throughout the province of Saskatchewan. Now, regarding my expertise in ethics and professionalism, I am the lead author of the official statement on professionalism of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons, or CAGS. Uh, I, also, I also founded the Department of Surgical Humanities in the University of Saskatchewan and was co-founder of the editor and editor of the Journal of the Surgical Humanities. Um, now, uh, I think uh, your viewers will, will, will agree that I'm qualified to comment on data and on ethics. I, I think they will agree. Um, we're, gonna know, we're gonna get to know Andre throughout this stream, but Andre, uh, let, let the crowd know who you are. 
Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I, uh, I'm a lawyer here in the province of Saskatchewan. I was called to the bar in Manitoba. Uh, I've, I graduated from law school 10 years ago. Prior to that, I uh, hold a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. In the 10 years of practice, I've appeared in every level of court uh, other than the Supreme Court. Uh, I joined the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms last year. Uh, I'm involved in a number of very high profile cases across Canada. Uh, yesterday, I, I appeared in Ontario for the Ontario Vaccine Passport Challenge, which is one of the most historic cases in Canadian history. Um, I'm excited to be on the right side of history. We're, 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 we're fighting very hard in maintaining the charter rights uh, of Canadians uh, from coast to coast. And we want to maintain public confidence in the judicial system and have these cases be heard so that uh, the charter can, can save the day. So I'm excited to be here with you. I'm, I'm very uh, excited to be counsel for Dr. Francis Christian. He's been uh, a very courageous physician in our community. He, he's one of the early uh, folks who, who stood up on very basic ethical principles of medicine. And we're looking forward to this case. We're looking forward to what will be revealed in this case uh, and to have justice served. Uh, Andre, can you summarize what the case is? Certainly. Uh, so I think it would be good to have a bit of a factual background. And, and, and Francis, feel free to jump in whenever, uh, if, if you want to color, color this. Um, essentially, uh, Dr. Christian, last year in June, had appeared at a press conference. Uh, he had a prepared statement. He had some facts that he was speaking to. Uh, it was a press conference that he held with, with two other physicians. Uh, and he, he essentially laid the uh, framework for the basic medical ethical principles of informed consent, as well as the precautionary principle of medicine. This came at a time when the province had uh, indicated that it was uh, essentially approving vaccination for children. And uh, this spurred uh, Dr. Francis Christian to speak on the issue of informed consent. And he was essentially speaking to uh, how, you know, what the benefits of the vaccine may be, what the harms may be, and what alternatives may exist, and, and these sorts of things. These are very commonly known and, you know, long-held principles of medicine. And after doing so, uh, he was essentially reprimanded. He was reprimanded by the college for which he held a position. Uh, he was also reprimanded by the Saskatchewan Health Authority, which is the authority, essentially the authority that administers medicine in the province of Saskatchewan for the Ministry of Health. And uh, he, there was an audio recording in which he was lambasted by a number of folks in, in the community uh, that were uh, in, in administrative roles. Uh, and uh, he was suspended in his role from the college uh, he, he was no longer permitted to teach his students. He was no longer permitted to act as the coordinator for patient safety in the surgical, uh, in the surgical field. Uh, and simultaneously, and interestingly enough, he was also terminated uh, concurrently uh, from the Saskatchewan Health Authority in, in a position that he held for a, a number of years. Uh, uh, I believe uh, by that point, it was uh, nearly uh, uh, two decades. And essentially, uh, Dr. Francis Christian, over this course of uh, a long period of providing excellent uh, care for his patients, and as you heard from him, being a trailblazer and providing new and, and strategic uh, technological advancements in his respective field, uh, despite having a very successful uh, period of time with uh, providing and administering medicine, which by the way, the, there's, there's a long, uh, there's an issue in Saskatchewan and in many other provinces with respect to, with respect to waiting times for surgical care. In, in the context of this, Dr. Francis Christian was terminated. Uh, he had a contract with them. Uh, but the, the basis by which he was terminated, although he wasn't provided reasons, was, was quite obvious. Uh, and uh, so he's suspended from the college. He's terminated from the, for the, from the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, that was the injury. Now, that, it didn't stop there uh, for Dr. Francis Christian. 
uh, they added insult to injury when they went publicly, they went on media and defamed him as being dangerous. Uh, uh, and I quote, the, they specifically used the word dangerous to define a, a, a long-standing physician in the community speaking on the basis, uh, uh, on the very pr basic principles of medical ethics. And uh, so, so they add insult to injury, they defame him. And interestingly enough, we're seeing a case out of Texas that has come forward. Maybe uh, uh, Robert Barnes could uh, comment on that if, he, if he's aware of it. It's, it's a new case, I, I just became aware of it today. A physician out of Houston has sued the Methodist Hospital uh, for $25 million uh, as a result of the Methodist Hospital uh, calling this, uh, essentially publicly defaming this physician as being dangerous for uh, prescribing ivermectin and also uh, opining uh, in, in her respective field with respect to her view of, she. I, I think she had uh, treated 4,000 or 2,000 patients for COVID-19 very successfully. And so she essentially was defamed and she launched a somewhat similar lawsuit though in a, uh, in a different jurisdiction, of course, in the United States with, with respect to being defamed as being a dangerous physician. And as she rightfully points out in her case, being a physician and being uh, labeled as dangerous uh, is essentially a death blow to your career. It's a death blow to your reputation. Uh, it leaves you in a position where, uh, I mean, mitigating your circumstances by looking for other work is, is nearly impossible when, you, when you're a physician for that length of time and then you're defined as being uh, or defamed as being dangerous. Uh, it, it, it's, it's certainly very uh, uh, detrimental insult to injury that occurred. So Dr. Christian, um, a year later, uh, has commenced a statement of claim uh, against the Saskatchewan Health Authority uh, with respect to the basis by which they had terminated him. Uh, and of course, the Saskatchewan Health Authority is uh, government. It administers uh, from the government uh, health care. And so it or owes charter protections. And, and Dr. Francis Christian has charter rights. He has a right of freedom of expression, expression belief, thought, opinion, and, and, and a right of conscience. Mm -hmm. And so the basis by which he was terminated was a clear violation of, of his charter protections. Uh, he's also uh, suing the Saskatchewan Health Authority for uh, defaming him publicly. Uh, and he's also suing the College of Medicine, who, by the way, uh, the College of Medicine had investigated the statements made by Dr. Francis Christian uh, as to their own internal investigation to determine whether he uh, engaged in any conduct that was unbecoming of a physician or or conduct that would be contrary to the uh, policies uh, in his respective profession. And they concluded that he had not. They concluded that he, in fact, had uh, every right to speak out. And, and in fact, uh, our position is not only did he have a right to do so, he had an obligation. This is a physician that has been uh, involved in, in patient safety for a very long time. And he's, 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 uh, he's been exemplary in terms of being a trailblazer for patient safety. Andre, if I can just ask one question of Francis, I know the answer because I asked you last time, but Francis, you're not just a published author and an accomplished doctor and a well-respected uh, member of the medical community. Prior to your termination or non-renewal of a contract, and maybe Andre will clarify later, had you ever been sanctioned, disciplined, reprimanded, or had any negative encounter with any employer, any institution with which you were associated? Never. Um, I, 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 in fact, uh, the, I had, uh, you know, my contract uh, uh, has periodic, uh, um, you know, they, 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 have to, they have to evaluate my performance. And I had very high performance reviews uh, my boss even said to me, if I could give you a bonus, I would. So, <laughs> you know, so no, uh, I, I've never had any negative review, never. And Dr. Christian, could you explain for the audience what informed consent means in the medical community and, uh, and, and what the principle is about do no harm first and how those principles play in in this context? 
Right. So uh, thank you for asking that question, Robert, because we now have what I would call a medical emergency in our kids, and that is protecting them from uh, uh, an injection they don't need and which can be quite dangerous to them. So that, that thank you for that question, because um, informed consent is so basic to our discussion. What is informed consent? It's a time-honored principle. It's, it's, it's not something we invented, uh, you know, after I started training to be a surgeon. It's something that's been there for, uh, you know, several generations. The philosopher, medical people have spoken about it. It's been, it's been embedded into the history of medicine. So informed consent is essentially where before you administer any injection, treatment, anything, the patient has to give consent based on an understanding. Now, it's not, not, not enough, mind you, it's not enough for, just to, for them to be given a piece of paper. I, uh, I'm familiar with what is called the Montgomery uh, decision in, in England, where the judge said it's not enough just to give them a piece of paper. They actually have to understand what's written in it, and you have to make sure that they understand. So you have to under the patient or the person receiving the injection must know the risk or the risks of uh, the injection, the benefits or lack thereof, and whether there are any alternatives, okay? So in this case with COVID uh, for the children, my press conference and in the press conference, I made very clear that I wasn't speaking on behalf of the college or public health or, um, or, or the Saskatchewan Health Authority. I was speaking as a physician uh, and a father to parents and the children. Uh, so, Let's talk about, uh, if, we, if you want me to, I can go through each of that, risk, benefit, alternatives. Now, if you talk about the risk, uh, I have to say, it's been appalling. The risks have not been explained to virtually anybody. Um, also, what about those who are already immune? Now, in various countries, it's been shown that children between 50 and 80 or 90% of kids have already had COVID. OK, so these kids, if they get a, a vaccine, what is that additional risk? So that's part of the risk, too. So the and, and now with the Omicron strain, part of the risk discussion is that, hey, this vaccine is for the Wuhan strain of the original vaccine of 2020. It does not prevent uh, uh, transmission. It does not prevent infection. It may make you sick and may kill you. And, and, and that, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in, in lay language, but this is, this is the truth. Some people have died after, after getting the, 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 the vaccine. Uh, in children, there is this thing called myocarditis. But remember, myocarditis is only one of several. There is a slew of uh, side effects from this vaccine. Uh, just look up any database. Look up the WHO database. Well, you know what, and Dr. Francis, not to interrupt you, I want to just bring one thing up so that anybody who dares say that you now are spreading disinformation or medical misinformation, I'll just pull up Dr. Kieran Moore and we'll just listen to him for five, what is it, 30 seconds. Listen to Dr. Kieran Moore. Instead of saying it's a personal decision. So that nobody can accuse you of anything. What's the risk? The risk, uh, there's always a risk to uh, to having any therapeutic, to uh, to having any therapeutic, 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 Dr. therapeutic, 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 therapeutic versus a benefit. You want to make sure there's a very strong benefit uh, versus the risk. If we're an 18 year old healthy individual, the ritual, the risk to getting hospitalized, hospitalized if we have no medical illness uh, is very, very low. We know there is a risk, a very small risk, one in 5000 that may get myocarditis, for example. Uh, we we can end it there. I just uh, so that no one dares say, Doctor Francis Christian, you're a you're a, an extremist spreading misinformation. That's Ontario's chief medical officer. I, I just googled it a few seconds ago. I see the news now is trying to cover up for him and say, oh, he was he was overstating it. So now getting back, Doctor Christian, to the small risk of myocarditis, well, pericarditis, uh, and other uh, issues. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, he says one in five thousand. Some other studies say one in two thousand five hundred. One in two thousand. I got to tell you, uh, 
this is only cases that are detected. Now, I know people who, uh, young people, um, you know, i give you an example. I, I know an engineer who is in his 20s. He said after this, his second dose, he had chest pain for about four weeks. His, he, he was a marathon runner. He could run only about 100 meters, and then he could only walk. He didn't go to the hospital. So that's a myocarditis case, but that wasn't detected. Silent myocarditis. So that's so just the detected myocarditis, one in 5,000. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're vaccinating millions of kids, that means thousands of cases of myocarditis. And then we were told that, hey, COVID itself can give you my myocarditis. The infection can give you myocarditis. Now, what does the data tell us? So there, uh, there is a very large Israeli study, okay, um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases from Israel. Uh, and this is a very good study because it showed that the risk of myocarditis from a natural COVID infection is not higher than normal. In other words, COVID infection does not pose a myocarditis risk for individuals. And this is across all age groups, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients. So the COVID infection does not increase myocarditis risk, whereas the vaccine does. So, and then you, when you talk of risks, you have to talk of short-term risks, including myocarditis, medium-term risks, um, various autoimmune problems and so on, and then long-term. Now, for an 80-year-old person who gets the vaccine, uh, who doesn't have many years ahead of him or her, long-term risk doesn't seem like a big thing. But for a 10-year-old kid, if our kids are getting this at four years and six months, my word, uh, this is becoming uh, a, 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 a emergency of massive proportions to protect our kids from this uh, from this unnecessary vaccine. So the risk also has to take into account the fact that for kids, uh, COVID is a very mild disease. Uh, the risk of dying of COVID is less than that in a bad flu year. So the flu, the annual flu, can kill more people than COVID. And then you have to look at the statistics themselves. How many kids actually died of COVID with the diagnosis only being COVID versus kids who died based on, you know, the fact that they were admitted to hospital with a whole lot of other things and they also tested positive for COVID. In fact, uh, there, was a, there was a scandal in Alberta where uh, one of our public health officers said some kid had died of COVID and then it turned out he actually had stage four brain cancer. And, yeah. and was it, and was in a coma, Dr. Dr. Christian. I, right. I went, I, I went over this thoroughly. Uh, Dina Hinshaw right. initially claimed he was the youngest uh, teen in Alberta to die of COVID. Yeah. The sister came out and said yeah. he was in stage four brain cancer right. uh, coma and then she retracted it. But I right. think uh, it, all in all in Canada, 19 kids under 19 and I think it's probably even less if we exclude died with versus died of, but correct. So, so that's all part of the discussion. We have to have a discussion of benefit. What is the benefit? Uh, the benefit is it for, first of all, it does not prevent or uh, it does not uh, avoid the kid from transmitting it. Uh, so even if you say that it, it sort of gives herd immunity and prevents kids from giving it to say, their grandparents, which is another scandal, by the way. Where in history of medicine have we used have we used children as human shields against the adults? It's the other way around, isn't it? Adults protect children. Children are not asked to protect adults. Even if that were true, shouldn't the choice be the child's? But it's not true. It's not true. It doesn't prevent transmission. It doesn't prevent infection. In fact, if you looked at, at the Ontario data, which they stopped doing, by the way, anytime the data becomes inconvenient, they stop giving it to us. But if you look at the da Ontario data, up until the recent data, if you had a booster shot, you were three times more likely to get COVID than if you were unvaccinated. So all this you know, has to be explained. Uh, the fact that uh, myocarditis is one of the problems, but there are other problems too. Um, there's the other ethical issue of inducing fear in children. Now, I know some grandparents who have said that, you know, my kid is 
is avoiding me because he's been told by his teachers and by some adults that, hey, you can kill your grandma. So my kid comes to see me and then runs away. I mean, this is completely ridiculous. It doesn't have any basis in science or ethics. And, and so children don't have a voice and we must be their voice. Uh, and that was the basis of my press statement on informed consent. Now, what are the alternatives? Uh, the alternative is not to be vaccinated at all, because for kids, it's not a problem. COVID is not a problem. Uh, the other alternative is, is if you do get COVID, there is a slew of treatments available. Now, if parents want to know what are the treatments available for COVID, what I would advise them to do is don't go to Google, because Google is, is uh, the algorithms are, uh, are, are skewed to take you away from alternative opinions. So, uh, and, and I don't want to go into why that is, but don't go to Google, go to, go to, don't go into Bing and things like that. If you go into Google, just go on the second page or the third page, use a European search engine like Metager, which sort of M-E-T-A-G-E-R dot org, which, which, which is much more fair. Mm -hmm. And also go to credible websites like the FLCC, uh, so the F, uh, Frontline COVID Critical Care Alliance has a website with lots of data on what works. Uh, and ivermectin is just one of several things that work in early COVID. Can you explain also to people what the precautionary principle is? Yes. Uh, so the precautionary principle or the principle of do no harm is essentially, again, a very time-honored principle. For example, um, David, you pointed out the fact that Kieran Moore was using the word therapeutics when he was referring to vaccines, okay? <laughs> I think... Uh, I had to splice it five times over and over and over again yeah. because once upon a time, we were told that it's a vaccine, and if you say it's not, that's conspiracy theory that can get you booted from social media. And I was flabbergasted to hear him say, to refer to it as a therapeutic. So, I mean, elaborate on what that distinction means in medicine. Right. So a vaccine, uh, it, by the way, the uh, CDC changed their definition of vaccine midway through this pandemic. Uh, but, but a vaccine yeah. traditionally has meant uh, something that prevents infection, something that prevents transmission. We know it, uh, the COVID vaccines do not prevent infection and they do not prevent transmission. So uh, do, they, do, they, do, do they qualify as a treatment rather than a prevention? Now, here's where it gets uh, even more murky and uh, you know, corrupt, really corrupt and I would argue in some cases criminal because of the fact that the FDA itself defines uh, genetic ther therapy, which is what the COVID vaccines are. Uh, in other words, something that alters the DNA or RNA structure or introduces uh, uh, a genetic component to alter the function of a cell. Uh, so the, 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 by the FDA's own definition, this fits under a genetic therapy. Uh, so if it's a gene therapy, uh, what, what, what does it mean? The FDA itself says that it should have a long follow-up period before it's even considered for human use, and they suggest 15 years. How long has this follow-up be period been? Six months? Eight months? You know? So therapy is very different. And, and so does it work as a therapy? Uh, if, you, if you think about therapy you'll have to think about how you, uh, how you can prevent the disease from becoming a very severe disease. So early disease becoming severe disease and hospitalization. Now that's where they suddenly pivoted uh, from the traditional time-honored historical definition of a vaccine as something that prevents infection and transmission. They turned that definition to say that, hey, this is actually a therapeutic. It'll prevent you from getting very sick. Uh, actually, uh, that data is very, very suspect, and I'll tell you why. Uh, between the first and the second dose, okay, or three weeks after the second dose, they're often called unvaccinated. And we know now the Alberta data, some which again they stopped giving us from 
uh, from a few months ago showed that Alberta is, a, is a, for Robert, is one of the provinces. Uh, you know, in Alberta, they showed that um, if you're in that three-week period after the second dose, your risk of death increases, actually increases. So you leave all that out, and then you say it actually prevents death is actually, uh, you know, pseudoscience, magic science, not real science. So, uh, so Dr. Dr. Christian, sorry, just to clarify, when you say within the three weeks of the first shot, risk of death increases from COVID or from all causes? From COVID. Okay. From COVID. And and actually, there is some basic science explanation. There was a paper out of Europe that showed uh, there, there are some complex and actually quite interesting reasons why that may be so. There are different cell lines that show decreased function after a vaccine, and that makes a person susceptible to infection, including with COVID. Uh, but but we before we can we can say that it actually prevents death from uh, from 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 this. We have to have a definition of what they mean by fully vaccinated, and how many people have died in in between the first and the second dose, after the second dose, and crucially, what is the all-cause mortality? In other words, let's say you take one group here, one group that is unvaccinated, compare it with another group that is fully vaccinated. Follow them over a year, and when you say fully vaccinated, you must include everybody from the time the injection went in, okay, and see how many of each group has died. So that's what we call all-cause mortality, not just from COVID, from a whole lot of things. Now, there's some disturbing data in that uh, respect, too, from UK, for example. Up until April, uh, there was excess death uh, in, the, uh, in the vaccinated group much more than in the unvaccinated group. So these are unanswered questions. You know, the questions keep piling up. And the first do no harm principle is that we don't know enough. We know enough to say, stop, it's a signal not to give this stuff. Let's adopt this precautionary principle, the first do no harm, stop this vaccine, um, stop the rollouts, definitely in kids, stop it. it uh, and, and, and sometime later, I can tell you a little bit about the terrible uh, Pfizer trial on six month old to four month olds. Uh, it's, it's, it's a scandal in its own right. And I can explain to your viewers in as simple a term as possible how that, how that was manipulated really. Dr. Christian, just one thing, actually, I want to read this. Thank you, Dr. For your honesty. That's all we've asked for during this two and a half year nightmare. And bringing it back to your lawsuit and your situation, you were sanctioned for saying this. How yeah. long ago? It's, it's about a year ago? Just over a year ago. And now, a year later, Dr. Kieran Moore, the chief medical officer of Ontario, is, is if not parroting, at the very least confirming what you said a year ago, or at yes. least warned about a year ago, and got sanctioned for. Yes, um, Andre, on the merits of the suit, what what uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What precedent do you have under Canadian law now, uh, or developments that you're going to rely on in Canadian law, you know, to support Dr. Francis uh, in his pursuit? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into the you know the position that we're going to have in terms of the, the legal arguments at this point in time. But I, but I want to reemphasize something that, that, that Dr. Christian has pointed out, is, which is his right of academic freedom. Uh, the way you defeat misinformation is by discourse, is by uh, having a, a discussion to, to get to the heart of a matter. If you're, you don't do it by censorship. When, whenever you see censorship, that, that's a bad sign. That's a sign that, uh, that something is being hidden and that they're afraid of discourse. Dr. Francis Christian is entitled to his, his, his opinion. He has a professional opinion and uh, his opinion with respect to medical ethical principles is, 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 is quite basic. Uh, and now what we're seeing is the vaccine narrative in Canada is, 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 is trouble. Uh, here you have the premier here in Saskatchewan months ago saying, we have to be honest with people the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission. You take it back six months prior to that, the government promised that if you get two doses of your vaccination, 
that all will be well and fine and that 70% of people simply needed to stick it to COVID as they said. But unfortunately, neither did COVID prevent, or excuse me, the vaccines prevent transmission. Uh, and they're admitting this now. But if you would have said this back in time, back, back then, that uh, the, the manufacturers themselves have indicated that it does not prevent transmission, you would have been a conspiracy theorist at that time. Now a lot of Canadians are beginning to, to realize that the federal government is now moving towards this new principle of up-to-date, uh, as they say, uh, saying that uh, you know the two doses weren't sufficient, uh, you'll now need doses every nine months uh, indefinitely. And so uh, a large portion of the population is going to become, quote unquote, unvaccinated very soon uh, if the federal government moves, uh, uh, you know, with respect to what it's what, it, what it's saying it's going to do. But moving back to this, this lawsuit, um, what's concerning is that Dr. Francis Christian has a statutory right of academic freedom. That's the purpose. Uh, one of the main primary goals of an educational institution like the university that he worked at is not only, sim is not only just to provide uh, education, uh, it's, it's to follow the basic principle of academic freedom. They're, they're required to do this and to suffocate and censor and to insult uh, a physician in, in such fashion is completely unwarranted and, uh, in our view, uh, requires punitive damages. Uh, and and we'll, be, we'll be seeking those damages accordingly. I think that it's important um, that, the, uh, that, that people who have been vaccinated, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of the population that has been vaccinated in, and, and and in good faith. They did so in good faith because they, they were told that uh, that this was something that, that they needed to do and, and in good faith they did. Now we know a lot more about, uh, about COVID-19. There's a number of experts worldwide uh, that have, and there's a lot of studies that have come forward and, and we're seeing a lot more information than, than, than we were, uh, that was available at that time when the vaccines were rolled out. And so people now have an opportunity to hear from experts on both sides. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen in a number of cases. One of the other cases that we're going, we're going to see that happen is the Ontario vaccine passport case that I alluded to earlier. This is a case where, uh, like many other provinces, the province had imposed the vaccine passport system in order for people to engage with society. And a, a very large portion of society was essentially removed from being able to, to, to have basic services, uh, social services met in terms of, you know, uh, going to gyms and, and bars and this sort of thing and restaurants and other types of human activity. And now that we know that the vaccine does not prevent transmission, how could the government possibly reimpose a passport system if there's no risk of transmission by taking the vaccine or not taking the vaccine. So that's just another example. We're going to have the science uh, tested in the court of law. And, and with respect to Dr. Christian's case, this case is, is, is going to be exemplary. It's gonna be precedent setting with respect to academic freedom. And we're seeing the universities and particularly the University of Saskatchewan being the receiving end of a number of uh, uh, freedom of expression issues. Even the former president, uh, Peter McKinnon, had commented about the uh, the state of universities across Canada with respect to freedom of expression, and he's he's opined on the matter. Freedom of expression is 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 a is a very important principle and uh, for academic freedom for physicians like Dr. Francis Christian to op to speak openly and freely about their respective field and and opine without having the fear of repercussions and without you know, being told as they told him that there, were, there was going to be consequences for, uh, for, uh, for him speaking out. So what we'd like to see is with respect to this case, we'd like to see uh, some evidence come to light. We'd like to see basic principles of, of academic freedom, freedom of expression, and 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 uh, uh, and certainly the defamation is another major part of this lawsuit because Dr. Francis Christian, as courageous as he's been, to stand up for the children, 
Uh, he's he's unfortunately been faced. Uh, he's been forced into retirement. Uh, could you imagine looking for employment when when you've been defamed in the media, and and essentially being called a, a conspiracy, a dangerous conspiracy theorist? And, and and I'll make one one more point about that. This term conspiracy theory has become an off ramp. It's become an off ramp not to have a discussion, not to have. Uh, open debate about issues. Uh, you know, people simply will say, "Well, they, if you don't think the vaccine is is good, well, that's just a conspiracy theory." And so it's become this off ramp for a lot of people, rather than to uh, recognize and consider, they're recognizing and dismissing and using this conspiracy theory off ramp as a way of simply not thinking. And that's a, that's a real issue, uh, Robert. I agree. Oh, yeah. Uh, Andre, I was going to ask, in watching the judicial systems of the West, especially Europe, Canada, the UK, the United States, it has been disturbing to many people to witness the judiciary be complicit in a lot of the what would be in Canada charter violating mm -hmm. rights in the United States, constitution violating rights, various provisions that apply under European law where most Americans assume they had certain freedoms and liberties that had seemed to have been stripped from them overnight in what is arguably the greatest medical experimentation on the public in Western history. Uh, uh, how much blowback have you experienced in the legal profession for taking the legal stands that you have? And do you think the Canadian judiciary, uh, as it has recently in the Alberta case and then in the Tamara case, uh, will step up and assert the and protect the charter rights of the people and the human rights of the people against uh, these extraordinary violations that we are witnessing on a daily basis? That's a good question, Robert. Um, I see that uh, the judicial branch of government is an essential component to democracy. It's essentially a vital piece of, the co uh, of democracy uh, it's a fail-safe mechanism. It's a defender of the Constitution. And, and the public interest depends on the functioning of the administration of justice such that the judiciary, the judiciary hears these cases without bias. And certainly, I think that um, a lot of people have expressed some concern about whether the, the judiciary has been complicit, as you put it. I, th I see it as, as more as though... Uh, judges are human beings. Uh, they they're they're uh, they're also uh, tuning into the the nightly news, and they're part of society just like the rest of us. And they they have confidence in many aspects of our public health and other things, just like the rest of society has had the, the majority of society. And so um, the issue is is uh, is seeing the as the cases come forward and the evidence being borne out, that the judges have the opportunity to see the fulsome evidence and what the evidence really is, and then uh, decide a case without bias. And of course, bias is an issue, and we're seeing uh, concerns with respect to, you know, there have been complaints with respect to the Supreme Court and, and, and comments made by the, uh, by the Chief Justice, and then uh, that, that, that complaint being dismissed. And, and so, the, the, you know, certainly there's an argument to be made that society right now more than ever depends on the judicial system. And we're seeing good cases. We're seeing some good decisions. Now, of course, it's, 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 uh, it's an ongoing issue and there's a lot of issues at play, but we're also seeing good cases, as you pointed out, the Alberta decision. And I think the courts of appeal, uh, that's their function. The court of appeal has this review power, has this power to really review cases in a different light. And, and, they, and, and we're seeing that uh, there's another case here in Saskatchewan that's actually going to be very significant for the country. Uh, the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal ha is, is currently, uh, we're awaiting a decision in the province with respect to a family law case, whereby two opposing parents, one wanted the child vaccinated, the other didn't. And of course the child was, uh, uh, I believe 13 or 14 years of age and didn't want to be vaccinated. It was a you know, mature minor situation. And the lower court had, uh, had ordered that the child be vaccinated against her will. Uh, and, uh, and of course the, the case was then appealed and the court of appeal has heard the case 
uh, and we're awaiting a decision. And this is going to be a, a significant case for Canada with respect to uh, maintaining many uh, basic principles of law as well as medical ethics. I don't think all hope is lost just because there are some decisions that are disfavorable. There are good decisions and we're waiting for the appellate courts. We're just not quite there. There's a cycle that's taking place. Cases are being heard in the lower courts and, and going one way or the other. And then they're working their way up to these appellate level courts. And uh, it's important to maintain our democracy. We, we must have confidence in the judicial system, but so too must the judicial system review cases without bias and that's the expectation of the public uh, and the expectation of, of democracy to be maintained. And, and so we will work accordingly in, in that respect and, and, uh, and, and hope for the best. Robert, you, you mentioned clinically testing on the world. You all remember when Obama, I'll, I'll just read it and then I'll show you why I can't show you the video. Obama, there was a video going around where he said, despite the fact that we have now essentially clinically tested the vaccine on billions of people worldwide, Around one in five Americans is still willing to put themselves at risk and put their families at risk rather than get vaccinated. People are dying because of misinformation. He says, because we've now essentially clinically tested the vaccine on billions of people. And that video went viral. And you may uh, have trouble seeing that video now because he deleted that video. He, I, It was his own tweet. Uh, and I, you know tongue in cheek, no one's quite as eloquent as Obama when publicly admitting to having committed crimes against humanity. He deleted that tweet. I guess he said the quiet part too much out loud. So if anyone's going to say that Barnes is exaggerating, Obama <laughs> himself said it. Video gets memory hold uh, because it was a very damning video. But Robert, I was going to put you up with Francis because you're going to have what to talk about on the Pfizer clinical trials. Dr. Christian, Robert is representing the whistleblower in the States. Oh, yes. So, I mean, who wants to start where? with the um, Pfizer clinical trials. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Chris. So uh, uh, as I said uh, to your viewers, uh, David, um, we, have a, we do have a medical emergency and that is protecting our kids. Um, uh, and and I, I do want to talk about this Pfizer trial from uh, just a few weeks ago for which they sought and got emergency authorization for the injection of this product, uh, which some public health officials are now admitting is a therapeutic product, not a vaccine, um, they got emergency approval, okay? Now, emergency use, uh, your viewers should know, is for something that causes serious injury or death. Uh, this does not cause serious injury or death to children. We have, we have talked about that already. It's not a threat to children, okay? Healthy children have more risk of dying of a motor vehicle accident or and like a two to three times as risk, as much risk of drowning than of dying of COVID. So uh, so so get let's get that out of the way. Now now for the trial. They had they recruited uh, four thousand five hundred kids into this trial. Now, before recruitment into a trial, Robert, uh, uh, we have to have what is called uh, an ethics board or an ethics committee from universities, like the trials I did, the clinical trials, uh, they, were, they were rigorously uh, approved uh, by an ethics board. I have absolutely no idea how an ethics board gave approval for this trial, because for a disease that poses no, no threat to, or very statistically zero threat, to healthy kids, how did they get approval to test a vaccine that by itself can be dangerous, okay? So out of the 4,500 kids Pfizer recruited, 3,000, 3,000 dropped out, did not make it through the trial, okay? This is in Pfizer's own data. Now, in any kind of trial, I would say this should disqualify the trial. Why did they drop out? Okay, they're not telling us. So okay. could it be could it be vaccine injury? Could it be hesitation? Could it be uh, you know that mothers looked at the data and and said, hey, this doesn't make sense. I don't want to experiment with my kid. But three thousand. Did they drop out before or after getting well, jabbed? The, uh, it, so that's what we don't know. Uh, this the 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 
number that they're, they're telling us dropped out is 3,000 out of the 4,528. So what that means is that the 3,000 are not being included in the analysis of the results. That's what statistically it means. It means it's, it's they, they did not make it, they dropped out. Okay, so if you look at the, uh, the 1,500 or so that remained, which is actually a very small number when you're testing a vaccine, you then look at what is called a placebo group, where they, 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 they inject just, say, saline, um, and then the vaccine group, where they inject the COVID vaccine. Now, how do they define severe COVID? Uh, they defined it in a very uh, questionable way, the you know, increased breathing, increased pulse rate, but whatever their definition was, there were six increased... Uh, I mean, there were six cases of severe COVID by their definition in the vaccinated group and only one in the unvaccinated group, okay? There was one hospitalization, no death, one hospitalization, that child was fully vaccinated, okay? Now, what about any COVID? Not severe COVID, any COVID, okay? Now, what they didn't include conveniently because it didn't suit their data is children getting COVID after the first dose. This is being done again and again by governments all over the world, but Pfizer did it themselves. So what they actually showed in the uh, three weeks between the first and the second dose is that there was a 30% increased risk of getting COVID in the vaccinated group. Okay. So they left that out. They left out also the data between the first and the second dose. And actually they gave three doses to these kids. So the seven weeks between the first and second dose, how many kids got COVID? They left out that data too. What about after the third dose? They left out some of that data too. So about more than 90% of the kids who actually got COVID, they left out of the data because it is inconvenient to them. Okay, so then they showed that among the groups, among the group that took the placebo, uh, there, were, there, there were seven COVID cases and there were four cases in the, uh, in the vaccinated group. So they said it, it prevents COVID, okay? So this is the kind of science they've been trying to fool us with, all right? Now, what about reinfection? So in other words, a kid gets COVID once and then is reinfected again, okay? So there were 12 total reinfections in the study 11 of them were fully vaxxed, okay? Now, based on this data, they sought emergency approval and got it. Now, how they got it is, is another scandal. Now, what about long-term effects? So we already talked. Okay. Dr. Christian, just one quick question. Yeah, you're, no. you're, you're not issuing an explanation or an analysis. You're just, you're just citing the data that I'm you just, have. Absolutely. I'm just citing Pfizer data. It's freely available. You can actually, I mean, it may be a little hidden to find, but you can actually find it. Okay. So long-term effects means effects going months, years later. So what did Pfizer do? Okay. After six weeks, they unblinded the two groups. Now, blinded study means the placebo group and the vaccinated group, the person actually... Uh, evaluating the result, doesn't know the child whether the child is vaccinated or not vaccinated. So the, the, the evaluator, the investigator is blinded in that sense. You know how, how they unblinded it? All kids after six weeks were who were not vaxxed were vaxxed. So they got rid of the placebo group altogether. They got that rid. To, that is to say that they proceeded to vaccinate the group that were hitherto not Vaccinated, not vaccinated exactly. in that control yes this is okay okay so 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 these are the, the this is really shocking and this is the basis of the approval of the vaccine which by the way health canada has also approved um, moderna which is the same kind of vaccine for the six month old to four year old mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what i would you know again i i have to say it's tragic it's it's terrible it's our children, it's, our, it's their future. And for parents, uh, my appeal to them is don't feel guilty. Um, you know, just look at the data. If you don't vaccinate your 
child, you're on very good, solid grounds. Very good, solid data backs your stand. Don't feel pressured. Uh, you know, during this whole pandemic, uh, there was a there was a great deal of coercion, which 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 is what I call blackmail. Okay, and the coercion and blackmail was, oh, if you don't vaccinate your kid, he can't play hockey, because the hockey hockey uh, clubs wanted everybody vaccinated. Uh, so parents don't get pressure, don't feel blackmailed, don't fear. Vaccines don't work. They don't prevent infection. They don't prevent transmission. Your child doesn't need it. They can be dangerous. And if they do get COVID, there's effective treatment for it. Now, is there any talk, like here in the United States, both the District of Columbia and the state of New Jersey are considering mandating the COVID vaccine uh, for all children. In the d case of DC, it doesn't matter whether it's public school or private school. New Jersey may be only limited to public school. Uh, is there any risk of that taking place in Canada? Uh, you know, <laughs> that, is, that is a good question because um, last year I told my son, uh, who's an economist, uh, I, you know, I said, this is almost cartoonish. One, one province puts out some really, really stringent, extremely tyrannical restrictions. And then another province says, oh, it's, we don't have it like we, uh, like, like, like Ontario. And then three weeks later, it comes to Ontario. Then, then Alberta says, oh, we are not like Saskatchewan. And then two weeks after that, Saskatchewan also gets those. So I don't know. Actually, I told my son, this is almost like they're operating in lockstep. And my son then said, Dad, didn't you know there was actually a document produced, I believe, in 2018 by John Hopkins? It's called Operation Lockstep. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's an enormous tragedy for our kids. And, 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 and I hope, uh, you know, uh, uh, Viva is giving uh, a lot of time to protecting kids, uh, not just through this, but through multiple of his uh, Twitter and other efforts. And I hope that our efforts save some kids' lives and futures. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I know people here in the United States whose children were injured uh, during the clinical trials, and they had doctors try to gaslight them into claiming it was anxiety, which reminded, it's like, hold on a second, she, she can't walk right now? That That's what, it's anxiety? It didn't happen until she went through these uh, COVID-19 uh, drug trials, back so-called vaccine trials. And, uh, you know, it reminded me of the Soviet Union, which at the end of the Soviet Union, when Chernobyl happened, I didn't even know this until I recently watched a documentary. There was uh, somebody who commented on one of our YouTube things that they didn't realize there was a documentary after their Chernobyl series. There is, in case you're wondering, you don't have to put in another YouTube comment and think I'm confused. There is a, uh, uh, that I didn't even realize the scope of it, but the Soviet Union tried to gaslight all of their people into believing there had been no radioactive fallout. There had been no health consequences. And so doctors were systematically lying to patients, telling them that, no, what you have is phobia. You have radiophobia. You don't, you, there is no, so their kid, was, I mean, they had children being born, they called them mermaid children because they were born with fish legs. And they're saying, nope, nope, that's just phobia. You had phobia when you were pregnant. I mean, that kind of insanity. And many believe, Gorbachev himself included, that it actually led to the complete collapse of the Soviet Union. It was the last step to show this government is so corrupt, it will corrupt the medical profession to lie to their own people and their own patients. Uh, how much, doctor, do you think this has damaged the cre I mean, people forget about a century ago, a lot of the med medical profession was considered quackery. Um, you know, two centuries ago, definitely true. Uh, the, the medical profession has established great credibility over the last century, and it seems like large parts of it ha are busy wrecking it and destroying it uh, like a wrecking ball in, in record speed by doing this, because sooner or later, the facts will be known. People will know whether this worked or it didn't work, whether it was safe or wasn't, whether it was effective or not. I mean, our own president here in the United States publicly told them that if you take the vaccine, you can't get it. He just got it again uh, after getting his four shots. Um, how much damage is this doing to the medical profession and how much damage will it continue to do unless more honorable members of the me medical profession like yourself step forward and say, 
Hold on a second. That is actually an excellent question, Robert. Um, there's something elegant, even beautiful, about the methods of science. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, mathematicians have often talked of the beauty of mathematics, how there's a certain elegance in the way numbers lead to solutions and so on. Science has a certain elegance, a certain beauty. And that is that is one of the terrible casual, casualties of this pandemic, okay? Uh, data, I mean, I just told your, your viewers uh, about the the, the, the fraudulent data on which Pfizer actually got this thing approved. I mean, when I say fraudulent, I mean fraud on some level because I can't imagine how this data can, can get emergency authorization. Uh, so the, the, there has been a great uh, destruction of the values of science that have been built up over the centuries. The evidence-based method uh, has been, you know, taken for a ride. I mean, you, uh, you, you have you have people, uh, you know, who had what was thought to be respected organizations, CDC, FDA, and so on. Um, you know, changing their, you know, Fauci once tells you that masks don't work, then he tells you masks work, then he tells you that the vaccines, if you get it, if you get the vaccine, you cannot get it. Then he says, oh, we have known now know that you can get it. So. Uh, the fact is they knew all along. And uh, why have been have they been lying to us? Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, but it, it, the, 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 the um, reputation of the medical profession has taken an enormous hit. It will take a generation or two before that is rebuilt, Robert. Well, Dr. Christian, my issue, and this is going to get to you, Andre, also, because I haven't just lost faith in the medical institution uh and it's not a, it's not only a present loss of faith it's retroactive i now look back at things that i were told were conspiracy theories 20 years ago and wonder if they were pulling the wool over our eyes then as well and andre i've utterly lost faith in the judicial system i appreciate the court of appeal is coming up big in one case a higher level court came up big in tamara lich's case except you know i'm still not cool with the terms of release Audrey, what do you think has to be done in order to regain any faith in the judicial process in as much as that might not be possible anymore? That's an excellent question. I think that what we must do, what we must ensure that we do during this period of time is we must make sure that we bring cases like this forward and give the opportunity for the, for the courts to do the right thing and to, to, to provide the decisions that must be provided on the basis of the evidence. We have to keep putting the cases forward. And the, the, we, you don't want to end up in a situation where you throw out the baby with the bathwater. You cannot, if, if, the, if, if we are concerned about Western democracy, we must ensure that our, our um, distaste with a decision here or there, or a, a number of physicians holding a particular view that seems egregious, that we don't just completely give up and say, well, though all faith is lost in the judiciary, all faith is lost in the medical system, and, and, and so then what? What we must do is we must continue. This case is about saving the medical profession. It's about, it's about honoring the medical profession as we, uh, as we want it to be. And we have to save the medical profession, and we have to give the courts an opportunity to render the decisions at the highest levels before we completely give up. And, and I appreciate, I understand there's a, lot, a number of declarations being made. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of lawyers across Canada that have signed declarations, uh, uh, you know, with respect to their concerns about how COVID has been handled. But I think we, we, we cannot lose hope. We cannot lose faith. The, the, our Western democracy and our judicial system has been has been in the making for hundreds of years, and it's not something to be uh, to be thrown away after two years simply because there have been uh, things that, there have been things that have happened that that make us lose faith. And so, what we must do now, and we're, we're, what we're seeing, the tide is turning to some in some respects in certain aspects of this uh, circumstance that we're in. We we have to press on. We have to move forward. 
and we've got to have truth prevail. And Dr. Francis Christian is just one of those warriors like the, 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 other, the, the two of you. Uh, you. You must continue the good work that you're doing with the cases you're fighting, Robert Barnes. I, I've been following you for a number of years, uh, as well as Viva. You have to continue on. And we've got to ensure that the public is receiving this information and that, uh, and that the courts have an opportunity to rule on Dr. Christian's case as they are going to rule on a number of other cases. So my, my, my prescription, if you will, would be that we must fight on because democracy is at stake. Uh, the rule of law is at stake. A very wise politician has recently told me that the rule of law is turning to the, the law of ru the rule. And, and so we, we've got to flip that back around. We've got to ensure that the rule of law is maintained. And, and I think that uh, cases such as Dr. Francis Christian's case are, are, vi are vital in ensuring that we reinstall important principles, both in the medical field as well as the uh, legal system. And I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I want to maintain that uh, air of hope that I think that uh, there are uh, members of our judiciary that will be uh, opining on cases such as this, uh, free of bias, uh, and and we will we will continue on in that direction as far as we can go. And Dr. Christian, can you explain? Like one of the things I've highlighted throughout this process is that we cannot trust a result that didn't go through a process we've had confidence in in the past, that the scientific method is a process we must go through, the public participatory right in the democratic process is a process we must go through, robust debate where dissidents have an open and equal voice is a process we must go through, not because of a particular outcome, but because it improves the probability of the accuracy of that outcome. Could you explain that like your case goes right to the heart of that, which is how do we avoid this happening again? We don't do the things that happen to you. We don't suppress dissident thought. We don't set censor independent thought. We don't sanction and punish those who challenge and question established thought. We welcome it. We encourage it. We invite it. We engage it. Could you describe why that part of the academic process has always been essential to getting the best outcome? And that is why I'm fighting this case. Uh, the, the, the issues here uh, are are so important, like you said, academic freedom, freedom of conscience, free speech. These are timeless values, uh, and they are all under threat. And 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 I got it. I got to say that this idea of academic freedom uh, has actually been under siege, not just during the COVID pandemic, but even before that. So the seeds of the present medical tyranny were laid probably, I don't know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But academic freedom, uh, in, in, in what does it mean? It means that if you don't like my idea, come to me with a better idea and debate it in open. And let's, let's, let's decide who has the better idea. That, that really is the basis of academic freedom. And we, on our side, and not just me, but a number of eminent scientists, physicians have been saying, okay, uh, let's let's do it like this. Let's have an open public debate on TV with people, you know, public health officers, scientists on the government side, and then we on this side. Let's talk in a in in a, in, a, in a very respectful manner. Let's talk to each other, and let that debate be publicized, televised. We've issued several invitations. Nobody on the other side is taking it up. So. Uh, I, I have to say, academic freedom and freedom—we have—we have no choice. We have to keep fighting. Uh, we, 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 th these are too precious a, uh, a heritage for us to lose. I also have to say that uh, you know, no tyranny lasts forever. Every tyranny uh, has a defined lifespan. Uh, however, uh, if people think that just because you're in a democracy, you are somehow prevented from living under tyranny, just look at the 20th century. Hitler actually came to power through a democratic process. He actually manipulated the democratic process and then, of course, was responsible for the genocide of, uh, you know, Jewish people, Polish people, Slavs, uh, you know, homosexuals, uh, gypsies, uh, and, and so on. Uh, you, then you look at uh, Mussolini. Mussolini came to power, again, initially through a democratic process. Mussolini defined fascism as the uh, coming together 
of political interest and corporate interest. So, uh, I, you know, I leave it to your viewers. Are we living under a tyranny now or, uh, or are we going in that direction? We have to keep fighting. We have no choice. Uh, now, I, I want to bring this over exclusively to Rumble, maybe for 15. Well, if, if we have more than 15 minutes, so all the better. But there's questions I want to ask that I want to ask without <laughs> with impunity, with actual free speech. So, everyone, I'm going to put the link to Rumble so that you can go watch it live on Rumble. Leave it down that alone is an issue that that, that cannot course. be maintained in, in a free and open democratic society for a major tech company to not permit open discussion. I think your viewers and everybody else should, yes. you know, it should always be exclusively wherever open debate and discussion takes place. Well, here's the, the, the issue is that YouTube is still, you know, I'm surprised it, this this stream got demonetized within two minutes and now it's remonetized. <laughs> So I think, Dr. Dr. Christian, I think your name might be in the YouTube bad books, but I've got questions. It's a big problem. And now I'm going to use the fact that we're on YouTube to bring those people to Rumble. And we're going to have, and I'll take questions from the chat as well that I've been holding off on, such as I've tuned in late. Has Novavax been discussed? Wait, wait for it. Uh, Viva, does the Dr. Christian know or think C19 new brands Omicron? Uh, does Dr. Uh, if, if they're going to introduce new COVID-19 vaccines purportedly to address the variant problem. But of course, historically, that's why there's never been a successful coronavirus vaccine is the variant problem. Uh, that's what some of us were pointing out at the inception. So the uh, that's but yeah, I think the the fact that we have to shift off of YouTube is a reflection of the whole point and principle of informed consent. They are trying to deny and deprive people around the globe of informed consent. They don't want them to have the information they need to give informed consent. And there's a reason why we established it in the Nuremberg Code after 1945. We said, never again, we're never going to allow mass experimentation on any public citizenry without their informed consent. A principle so critical, it's considered a just Kogan's principle of international law and is, as Dr. Krishna has previously mentioned, a core principle and probably the primary ethic of all of medicine. And that's what they're trying to eviscerate and obliterate because it doesn't serve their political purposes. Now, with, with that said, people, I'm going to end this stream here and panic because I only have done this twice before. We're going to carry it on on um, Rumble. And uh, Shotgun, I'm asking the first question. Now, I'm ending it, people, on YouTube. The pinned, the, the link is in the pinned comment. Huh? Is this going to work? We shall okay. soon find out. Let's find out. Okay, so now. This is, this is when Robert Barnes is going to pull out the cigars, right? Hold on. <laughs> oh, you know what, Robert? It might be time. Let's see. 3,000. Okay, and I see an ad on Rumble. Okay, let's going to skip it. So I don't know. Okay, hold on. Yes, people were live on Rumble still. Woo, okay. That means I'm not going to see the chat unless I go here. Okay, good. It does work. I can't see you guys while I do this. I wish there were another way to do this. Dr. Christian, I am a, a, a very proud, uh, compulsive, neurotic, uh, anxious individual. Myocarditis, pericarditis. Hypothetically, the, who, which demographic is in the greater risk uh, at large versus the greater risk for diagnostics? Because I presume, uh, I don't know, it, it does, does it necessarily affect more young people than middle-aged people to adults? Or are young people more likely to start going to the hospital if they have chest pains and thus more likely to get diagnosed? Uh, myocarditis in the context of COVID vaccine, uh, and, and I already showed you, uh, or I told the viewers about this very big Israeli study, hundreds of thousands of people, if you get a natural infection, you're not at increased risk of myocarditis. But vaccine-related myocarditis is more common if you are younger and if you're male. So, uh, yes, it is a problem uh, if you're younger and if you're male. Now, mind you, this is, again, only those who seek attention for chest pain. Uh, it's possible that if you're older... Uh, and let's say you already have some level of uh, medical problems. You let's say you have heartburn from uh, you know years of uh, acid reflux. Uh, 